To me, there's no place like Vilcabamba. How did you, how do you get to Vilcabamba in 1976? When we opened the juice bar in October of 2010, we had maybe 10 or 12 uh, daily customers. There were famous people that had come in the early 70s to study the rum peppers. Believe it or not, foreigners were getting mur murdered back in the 80s here. So you guys have been doing a lot for the community as much as any government. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Jesse Bayer joined today by Dennis D'Alessandro. Did I get that That's pronunciation right. reasonably <laughs> right? Um, this is our ongoing Expat Life Ecuador series. Um, you know, we, we try to interview kind of some of the interesting folks around town, share different people's perspectives and life stories who have made their home here in Vilcabamba and surrounding area. Dennis is kind of an OG. Dennis has been here a long time. Um, he's seen a lot of change. Uh, Dennis ha Dennis's wife is from Vilcabamba. Um, he set up his life here. They, they are the proprietors of the Juice Factory, which is, uh, I don't know, maybe the most famous business in town, if not certainly one of them, where you can get, our office is actually right next to the Juice Factory, so I spend a lot of time there getting amazing smoothies and juices. So we'll certainly tell that story today, get Dennis's perspective on Vilcabamba life here, some of the changes he's seen over the years. Unfortunately, Dennis's wife, Maria, uh, who's from here, is working today at the Juice Factory, so we couldn't grab her story today. But we'll mix in some footage, kind of show you guys a little bit of their business and you know, their life here. But I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And, My uh, pleasure. Guys, if, if you do enjoy this content right now, hit the like button, please. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell as well. We really appreciate that. And without further ado, we'll jump, we'll jump right into it. So let's, um, let's just start with a little bit of background, kind of where you're from and you know, what, it, what was your life like prior to Ecuador? Well, I was born on my grandfather's farm about 28 or 30 miles northwest of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And uh, so I grew up in a big Italian family. All my grandparents, all four of my grandparents were born in Italy. And um, so I grew up right next to my uncles and aunts and cousins and grandparents. Nice. And we had a big farm and lots of family get togethers and lots of uh, homegrown food. And yeah, it was great. I mean, I had a really idyllic childhood. I spent a lot of my free time in the woods, getting to know the plant life, the animal life. And uh, so I had, I had a nice mix of lots of family around, but also a lot of nice uh, natural space to get to know. Uh, non-human <laughs> yep. entities as well. So yeah, it was just perfect. Of course, uh, at some point in my life, you know, I got kind of disillusioned with life in the U.S. and that's, yeah, you know, ended up what brought me here. What, um, what did you, were you, you were kind of a naturalist or what was your profession prior to Ecuador? Well, um, I, was a plant collector uh, before I came to Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And so basically what I was doing was uh, acquiring different ornamental plants and orchid plants, cactus plants. And I had built a greenhouse uh, while I was in, in my second year of college at Penn State. So it kind of, I was studying engineering, but I never really liked engineering. It was something my parents wanted me to study. Mm -hmm. But I was more into, you know, I probably should have studied botany. Right. But um, so I built up this plant collection that was so big, I, you know, went from my house to a little add-on greenhouse to this house I was renting outside the university. And... Uh, so I got to know a lot of the nursery people, 
you know, and then eventually I got a job working in a nursery to help kind of pay for my education and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I met eventually this man who was the president of the Central Pennsylvania Orchid Society. He used to come to the nursery where I worked and he started getting me interested in orchids. So as time went by, I had this desire to come to either Ecuador or Colombia. This and is what year? For years? three months in 1976, 1977. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, eventually I came to Ecuador to spend three months. And this man who was president of the Orchid Society in Central Pennsylvania, he, he told me, he had asked me if I had any time before I came back, if I could collect him some orchids. This was back before there was any, well, there were any uh, like international laws against importing or exporting orchids. Okay. And um, so about one week before, and I had collected a lot of plants, and then about one week before I was ready to go back to the States in 1977, I thought, well, I'm going to go collect John, John Haig some orchids, right? Mm -hmm. So I go out to this area, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, towards the jungle, towards Lago Agudio from Quito. So but back then, north. it was just, you know, there, were, there were, was no real, like, vehicle traffic. There were right. buses and, you know, motorcycles maybe, but uh, they were few and far between. So I got off the bus in this area that looked good, and I collected orchids for a while, and um, came back down to the road, and I just sat there, wait for a bus, you know? So, <clears throat> I see, because this was a straightaway, I see this truck coming, it was kicking up dust, and so I stood up, and I stuck my thumb out, and he stopped. Yeah. So I threw the bag in the back of his truck, and I got in, and I spoke a little bit of Spanish, not much. Mm -hmm. Enough, though especially about plants. So within minutes, he, uh, he looked and he said, is that, a, is that a bag of orchids? And I said, yeah. And he said, and so we started having this conversation and he tells me that he knows this man in Quito who works for the Ecuadorian government and he's looking for someone to teach an Ecuadorian how to grow orchids. Okay. Okay. And so he says, you need to go see him. And so he gave me his information, his, uh, his address and phone number, and I went to see the guy. And within, a few, within maybe one hour, he, he showed me this orchid collection. He said, this project is in a place called Vilcabamba. Okay. He said, we would, we would offer you a contract, a four-month contract. You know, you teach this person to grow orchids, uh, to, to, to take care of this collection. And then you can come back and you can leave. And I said, well, I'm going to the United States in a week. And he said, well, uh, keep me posted, think about it, and, um, and let me know. And if you're interested, we can talk about a contract and a visa and, and uh, so that's where it stood. And then, so I got back to the States and my family, you know, I said, no, you're not going back there. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, anyway, of course I had a desire to maybe do this because I, four months for me at that point in my life was easy to come back and do this. So I thought, well, I'm gonna make this decision on my own. I'm gonna backpack into some forest in central Pennsylvania, spend a weekend, and make a decision. So I go uh, by myself, backpack into this forest, pitch a tent. There was still some light. So I decided to take a walk. I walked from maybe here to the other side of the room and there was a blooming orchid in the ground. <laughs> yeah. It was the first time I had seen a blooming orchid in the ground in Pennsylvania because where I lived, there weren't, it wasn't an area where yeah. uh, there were any blooming orchids. So it, anyway, that was, you your know, sign. that was it. Yeah. That was the sign. So, you know, everything was taken care of. And within months, I was back here. I didn't really know 
I had come to Bill Combombo once for one day when I'd first gotten to Ecuador before I started to collect plants. And, uh, but that was, I really didn't get to know. I just wanted to see what the long heavos were all about, right? Oh, so that was, so that, that idea of people living in late, you know, living older than most places was already here then in, oh, the, yeah. in the 70s. Yeah, there had already been people here. There were famous people that had come in the early 70s to study the long heavos. Quick, quick question. How do you, how in, in the late, you're talking about 76, 77, how did you, how do you get to Vilcabamba in 1976, 77? There, I came on, the first time I came was on the Cooperativa Loja. From Quito. Uh, I, no, wait, let me think. The, well, when I came in 76, it was the Cooperativa Loja. That's that was a, a, a 24 bus hour bus ride. Okay. And it was like a school bus. Okay. And, and yeah, just, it was miserable. Just for reference, so right now from Quito to Loja is a 10-hour bus ride. Something like um, 10 or 11, I yeah, guess. So yeah, so it was 24 then. So that's the difference in the quality of the roads, I assume. Yeah. When I came back in 70, late 78, early 79 to start this job in Vilcabamba, because the greenhouses are, are where the zoo is, right? Okay. That's where the orchid greenhouses are. And they were just being built then in 1978. So when I got here, when I flew, came back then, we flew in from Guayaquil to, to, to Catamaya. Okay, so they had the airport. It was just they a had little, the airport it, then. It, it, there were maybe, I don't know, 20 people on the flight. Was the airport then in the same location it is now? Same location, okay. yeah. Yep. So yeah, we flew in. Okay, and then from Catamaya, a bus into... We came, someone... Actually, I came with some other people who lived in Vilcabamba that were on the same flight. And they said, you know, well, come with us and we'll show you around. So they had a vehicle so or? They, they had someone with a vehicle that was waiting for them. What, yeah. um, I, I'm just curious because very few people can speak to this history well. What, like, were cars at all common in this region then or were they rare or? No, they were rare. There were only two vehicles in Vilcabamba then. They were owned by two brothers, um, Cesar Carpio and Lucho Carpio. Yeah, yeah. I know <laughs> they, what you're talking about. <laughs> I think it was Lucho's wife still washes clothes. She has a place in the middle of the park. Yep. She's wow. She's still there. Okay, okay. So I, I didn't want to interrupt too much. I just wanted to give a little context. Okay, so you come back to Vilcabamba, yeah? Yeah. Came back to Vilcabamba, and then I was teaching this guy how to take care of this orchid collection because there was already a small collection there, and we were collecting more plants. And um, after about two months, he decided he didn't like it, and he quit. Okay. And at that point, at that time, um, maybe a lot of well, the, most of the viewers probably don't know who he is, but. Uh, uh, Chato Castillo was the executive director of that project at the time. Okay. This was before he ever became mayor or anything. Yeah, so this is, uh, Chato Castillo was mayor, I believe, three times. I think three times. Well, bef way before that, he became what would be the equivalent in the U.S. of a senator okay. first. Okay. So he was, uh, he lived most of his time in Quito back then. Okay. But uh, yeah, he was the executive director, and so after I was hired by this uh, forestry manager, he was uh, in the forest. He was the head of the forestry department in the in the Ecuadorian government when he hired me, and then within months it was taken over and everything was moved to, to Loja. At the beginning, it was all taken care of in Quito, and then within months it was moved. To Loja and then Chato, he loved the the the, the uh, orchid project. They had back then they were helping build a dam with Peru. It was called Predesur. It was program oh, yeah. for the development of the southern part of Ecuador. And so they had projects in the Loja province, the El Oro province, and the Zamora province. And they were building roads and dams and mm -hmm. the orchid project, they, they were also uh, raising trout and uh, tilapia in, in here at this place in Vilcoma. And the orchids, and the zoo was just beginning. 
And so this was a tiny, as far as their total budget, this was one of the projects that very was allotted not uh, much money at all. Mm -hmm. So it, it just became bigger as time went on, but because Ville Capombo was growing. And the reason Chato offered me a lot, he offered me a, a longer term pro, pro, uh, contract when this young man that I was teaching quit because people were coming uh, from other countries and most of them, what they had in common is they spoke English and they, they liked having someone that could sure. explain things in English. Sure. So I ended up working there almost seven years. Oh wow, okay, so I wanna get into that in a second. I want to do another minute here just of, of some of the historical context. So late 70s, early 80s, what, what is Loja like? What is Vilcabamba like? Is it 10% of the size it is now? 5, 20? Is it, you know, you, you mentioned there's only a couple of cars in Vilcabamba. Like what is, what is it like here at that time? Well, um, there still weren't, weren't many vehicles and there was maybe, there, I think there was only one bus company coming from Loja to Vilcabamba even in the mid 80s, the Soto Oriente. And um, as far as the size of the town goes, the actual town itself, you know, it's always has been Probably, you know, the main part is like three blocks by four blocks or something like that. It's grown a little bit, you know, now there are two uh, traffic lights right. and there were no stop signs back then. And it was, all the streets were dirt. There weren't any paved roads. And, and the road to Loja wasn't paved either, not at all. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably paved from where the entrance to the, the Parque Polo Carpas down to the city. Okay. And then from there all the way down to Vilcabamba, it was dirt. And so the roads in Loja were mostly paved at they that time? They were paved, okay. yeah. They were paved. And there, so was there still, like in Loja, late 70s, mid 80s to mid 80s, was there still people riding around in horses and things like that, or I, not so no, much? No, okay. in, in Vilcabamba, yes, but okay. Loja, no. Okay. Loja, there were vehicles, and uh, I can't really remember much because I didn't go to Loja that often. Okay. Really. Yeah. I mean, it was still a long drive. The, fir the first time I came here in the 70s, it was three hours from Loja wow. on a bus, on an open air bus. <laughs> wow. And, so that and there was a landslide, so that was right. part of the three hour way. <laughs> right. So that's just for people. So it's. There's now a highway, which, I mean, we call it a highway. It's a two-lane road, yeah. but, it, but they call it a highway. And it's, it's a 45-minute, 40, 45-minute yeah, drive 40, 45 now. minutes, yeah. right. Okay. Wow, okay, so different times. Okay, so, you're, so you did that for seven years, you, meant, you said? About seven the, the years, The orchids. Yeah. Okay, and are, did you, so you're living here that whole time, uh, I assume, and, and so you, did you meet Maria during, then, or when did that, when did you meet Maria? I met Maria in 1987 in the park. So about 10 years in. About 10 years in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, at that time, I was uh, in the process of getting divorced from my first wife. So I had been single for a f quite a few years, three maybe, and um, hadn't really dated anyone. And I met Maria. You know, it was one of those serendipitous things yeah. where. Yeah, she was, I had just came back from Loja and I had a bunch of things I had bought at the market and uh, there was no super maxi back then. Right. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of stuff and so I went to talk to one of those two brothers and uh, they had a, a driver of the, one of the, of Cesar's truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he came to pick me up in the middle of the park so I could load my stuff on his truck and bring me up here. And Maria and her sisters were just hanging out there. They were just happened to be maybe buying something or visiting someone there where I was standing. And so when I was putting my things in their truck, I just asked them, I said, you want to go for a ride? So they got in the truck and came up 
in the back of the truck, and Maria handed me all my bags one by one, and I thanked her. And I thought, that, well, that was it, right? And within days, because I had never seen her before. So within days, I had a group that were coming from the, I think, the Seattle, Oregon area to collect orchids, and I was going to guide them. And they were staying in a hotel, uh, which the, now is that place where they take care of old people. Okay. It was a, it was a big government hotel then. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went to meet them there to pick them up to go out and collect, and um, there was Maria. She was the babysitter of the manager. And so while I was waiting for these people that I was going to take out orchid collecting, they were eating breakfast. So I just struck up a conversation with Maria. And uh, the rest yeah. is history, so the to speak. Is history. OK. And that was 35 year, 37 years ago. We've okay. been married 35 years now. So that's OK. So that's 87, you mentioned. That was 87. Okay. We got married in 1989. So okay. we dated for a couple of years. And then how quickly did you guys have kids? And did that, did you have your first children? How many children do you have? I have five. Five. And I had you three that um, they were living with me here when I met Maria. Okay. And then um, three from a previous marriage. Three mean? from a previous marriage. And then Maria Two. had our first daughter in 1990. Okay. And uh, here. Yeah. So here in yeah. Loja, in, the, in the Clinica San Agustin. Okay. Because yeah. then at some point you guys spent some time in the States yeah. after that. Then we went to the States for what was supposed to be an eight to 10 month trip to, for Maria to get to know the family. Nice. And so we were there maybe four months, and Maria found out she was pregnant again. So that's when all of my family started talking us into her staying there to have the baby, mm -hmm. which we did. And you know, then it was talking us into having our first daughter go into kindergarten there, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, meanwhile, I was coming back and forth because we, I was still involved in, in an orchid project here, so not with the government though. Mm -hmm. It was a private thing. And so, you know, years went by really and Marie and I would come together uh, most of the time, the two of us, because my oldest daughter at that point would be, you know, it, it got to a point where she could take care of my two kids and my sister was there, my father was there. And so once in a while, Marie and I would come together to build Obama, but most of the time it would just be me. And I'd spend probably uh, every year, I would spend almost two months here in Vilcabamba. I'd make three trips, th stay three weeks at a time. Yeah. So, so what for how many years then were you guys back in the States? Almost 19 years. Oh, wow. Okay. <clears throat> so that would have been basically the 90s and 2000s. Is that right? Right. Okay. And then, and then you guys, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it was like 1990 to almost 2009. Yeah. Okay. And that's Pennsylvania again. Area. Pennsylvania. Yep. Right. Okay. So you're in, back in the house I grew up in. Okay. What did you just curiosity? What did you guys do for those years back home? Well, I was uh, traveling around the world and buying and selling orchids and I was being invited to different orchid events and, you know, to give talks on... Oh, cool. My, be, because when we were working on this project here in Bilcobamba from the late 70s until the mid 80s, this group of people that I worked with and I, we discovered over 100 new orchid species that had never oh, wow. been seen before. So it became really interesting to people who were orchid fanatics. So. Sure. You know, I went around the whole the country and Canada, Alaska, Europe, Very cool. Asia, giving talks on this whole story. So then what brought you guys back to Ecuador? So I guess at that point, when you guys came back, your children are grown, essentially, at that point. We, we were sort of waiting for them to graduate high school and get into the university and so we can make move your back escape. Here. <laughs> okay. And that's what we did. As soon as the as soon as they 
because they were only one year apart, <clears throat> you know, one of them became a freshman, and then, uh, and then when she became a sophomore, the other one was becoming a freshman. So that's when we came down. Maria wasn't real happy about it, actually. Oh, really? She, you know, she wanted to stay close to the kids. Sure. And so... This was 2010? 20... This was, yeah, late 2009, early 9, 2010, 10, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when the idea, because at that point we thought, well, if now we've been gone so long, the orchid thing is kind of, you know, it's going to be maybe just a go from a business to a hobby. So uh, what are we going to do? Right. So we had been making green juice in Pennsylvania with you know, for a long time with wheatgrass and in the spring things from the garden. And so that was kind of an idea. And uh, it was like, you know, bring, bring longevity back to Vilcabamba. So that was what we, during those first few months here in 2009, we were thinking about maybe making green juice and getting people interested more in healthy food. Mm -hmm. Sorry, real and quick. So 2009, are there a bunch of foreigners here at this point or not really? Well, to give, you know, to give it some context, when I left, in, when we left in 1990, there were maybe 10 or 12 foreigners here. Christmas, birthdays, holidays, we were all together. Okay, mm -hmm. and just imagine that compared to now. Right. Okay, so when we opened the juice bar in October of 2010, we had maybe 10 or 12 uh, daily customers. Okay. Mofufu. Oh, he was here, okay. Uh, I don't know if you know um, Greg and Rini. I'm not sure. You already know Greg. Rini passed away. Mm. And uh, Greg... Charlitos was open. Oh, he was here. He was okay. open. Yeah. He had opened, I think, you know, 2009, maybe earlier than we did. Yep. But, uh, yeah, no, we had, it was like a little breakfast club <laughs> right. everybody showed up at the same time sort of like it is now but there yeah i mean and then when matt monarch came what year do you know what year that was i want to say he came in maybe late 2010 okay. also so or 2011 mm -hmm. people started showing up that were and there was a, a man named Mike Adams. Yeah. Right? You heard about Mike Adams. Let me then... just give two seconds of context. So Matt Monarch has the raw foods, raw food world, raw the, foods the world. The raw food world. Um, so he uh, has a big business doing, doing raw food, packaging products, things like that. Uh, Mike Adams, known as the Health Ranger, has, uh, I think it's naturalnews.com, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were, those two guys in particular, I got here in 2013, so I got here a couple of years later, but those two guys in particular were, were making content about the area and sort of promoting the area to some degree. And so a lot of people that came during that time frame, basically up until when I got here, was a result of those two sort of talking about Vilcabamba. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, because Matt was, was uh, like you said, even before you came, and I mean, even after you came, he was still yeah. producing content uh, and selling land also. Oh, right, and, that's right, yeah. And um, so he was also bringing products from his warehouses in California, and we were selling those in the original juice bar. Okay. And... Yeah, just let me go back, Jesse. Sure. The, the way we started the juice bar, as I said, we, it was an idea be, uh, we had because we were experienced with making green juices and, and drinking green juices with a group of people close to where we lived in, in Pennsylvania. 
And so when we came here, we brought some wheatgrass juicers and we, we were making green wheatgrass juice here. And so uh, what kind of, one of the things that stimulated us into uh, actually turning it into a business was when we were in the States, you know how in Spanish, um, the adjective for, is usually, uh, pro, it, it comes after the noun. Yeah, it's reversed. Yeah. Like Casa Grande, you know, which is a big house. Well, Maria always wanted to open a juice bar. And so she used to say, let's open a bar juice. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, that I, she'd say that once in a while, and it, you know, it would just be something for us to laugh to about because we it. were in Pennsylvania. Right. And, you know, we spent a lot of time in and out of health food stores. And, mm -hmm. you know, we lived on the products like that as well as what came out of our garden. So it was a natural progression. So when we got here, uh, we were running out of money. We had, you know, we were, we had in 2000, late 2009, we came with our daughter who was going to, she went into her senior year of high school here. And... Um, so we were just spending money we had saved. And so uh, we thought, let's take some green juice to the Sunday market and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So we prepared some trays of wheatgrass and set the, and some, some uh, pieces of paper explaining what wheatgrass was and what its health benefits were. And we sold eight glasses of wheatgrass juice for $1 each. And we came back two hours later, and we were so excited that we, we <laughs> made eight our first eight dollars. <laughs> <clears throat> and so it grew. Within a few months, Matt Monarch had a retreat. Yeah, yeah and he would do the, the raw food retreats he, he, that, for a number his of His first years. raw food retreat, that Sunday, we had people in line. We sold... 80 glasses of wheatgrass juice and the wheatgrass juicer it was a it was a an electric machine at that point because we had started out with a hand crank and so you know fairly soon the people at the market let us uh, bring a machine that and an, with an extension mm -hmm. and we plugged it in but anyway that, that machine that day when Matt, Matt Hart had his retreat that machine almost seized up it was so hot you couldn't touch it and so it built up like that, and people then wanted to drink green juice during the week. So we were taking green juice on our bicycle to Tiendas <laughs> and leaving them in refrigerators with their names on them. We were selling like 30 glasses of green juice a day. And this is, this is 2010, we're talking This was 2010. Yeah, okay. And so we thought, well, let's open a place and add some smoothies, and that's, that's, what, that's how it started. Yeah, and so, so, so when I get here, right, three years later. So I, I roll into town in towards the end of August uh, 2013. Um, I stay at Ishikai Luma uh, for a couple of months while I look for a rental. And that's kind of my introduction to Vilcabamba. So at that time, the juice factory, which was in the center square, um, you know, sort of across the street from the church, uh, sort of caddy corner to the church, the, the juice factory at that time, it was like it, and it still is now to a large degree as well. But at that time, there was more seating and it was sort of the social hub of the town, at least for the foreigners. You know, it was sort of the place you went where you knew everybody, you saw everybody, you, you know, you, you talked to people you wanted to talk to. You had a, an amazing salad or, an, or the soups that Maria used to do were incredible. You get a juice or a smoothie and like you could spend, people would commonly spend hours there. You know, you would, you could spend half the day there if you wanted to, just in conversations and kind of doing that. So that's kind of, you know, I, I mean, I think I probably ate there every day for, you know, as long as it was there, basically, because uh, the soup was so good and you get the juices in it, and then you had the social scene. So, so, you know, I didn't know Vilcabamba prior to the juice factory, um, but it was really, yeah, really like, really became sort of the hub for folks, you know, in town. Um, so, okay, cool. So you do, so 2010, 11, you, you're into, you've got your location now, you started your business. Um, what, so then you guys, 
uh, have been here obviously since then. Um, you've, you, you probably hadn't built then at that point. Probably that was later. We're sitting now at Dennis's house. When, when did you guys build and kind of get yourself set up that way? Well, this area here, where we're at now in this part of the house, this was our original house. This okay. was the original uh, shape of the house. It was okay. an octagon made out of wood, one floor with a loft. Okay. And uh, that was built in 1979. And then in 2012, we knocked it down and started to build this. And uh, it took about a year. We moved in in 2013. Okay. So, but back then, I mean, there were no doors and windows. We just moved into the bedroom, cooked outside. Yeah. So. What, a, what a beautiful story. Um, okay, cool. And then, and then obviously when COVID hit, was that when you guys closed the original location? That's when we closed. Yeah. So yeah, there was, it was March or April of 2020. Okay. Yeah, a lot of we closed our office in Loja then as well. We couldn't even get there. We were yeah. we were living in Landangi at the time and could only drive to Loja a couple of days a week for a few months. So, yeah, yeah, we tried to open for a while. I mean, we were. Uh, I think th there was a government uh, restriction on food service businesses, so that we were only a, a allowed to offer takeout food. Okay. So we tried it for a while. Uh, I think we probably let people know somehow that we'd be open from, you know, a few hours in the morning and we would just have smoothies and juices. Right. And, uh, and so, you know what it was like. Yeah. I mean, people in line, out, a small line outside on the sidewalk with masks and yeah. us with masks in a window with bars and it was just it, it didn't last more than a yeah. month or so and then we thought you know we're just we need to just quit and maybe we'll open later on or maybe we won't sure how long later did you guys open the current location well we opened in um the new location in in um i think it was it was December of 2020. So we were closed, say, from April of 2020 to, until December of 2020. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, so, you know, as, as someone who goes back to the 70s in terms of experience in Ecuador, you know, you've seen a lot of change, a lot of gyrations, all the political gyrations, the different... Um, stuff that's gone on over the years with, of course, development and safety and everything, right? So, you know, having that perspective, what is, what is your perspective currently on sort of the state of Ecuador as it relates to what, however, wherever you want to take it, but politics, safety, like what are your sort of overall thoughts on some of that stuff given, you know, you have a, a sort of a, what, a 40 plus 50 year history of, you know, at least observationally, either living here or being connected to it in one way or the other? It's a pretty open-ended question, but take it yeah. wherever you want. Yeah. Well, uh, the politics of Ecuador, I've been, been basically not really involved or, or uh, made it an important part of my life because it seems like of all of the presidential administrations that have come and gone since I first came here. Uh, Vilcabamba is sort of an island of its own that is insulated from uh, almost all decisions made on a national level. And uh, so Politics on a local level uh, are more interesting. Right. Knowing what people are doing here, as far as the people that uh, have the power of the decision making when it comes to things that people need most in Vilcabamba. And uh, I'm sure you, you've, uh, you've been part of that whole thing because you guys have been doing a lot for the community as much as any government body, because uh, for us, it's always been pri primarily about uh, food safety, uh, 
water quality and you know being educated as to you know what's a good diet and as opposed to what people normally eat here maybe sure and so yeah i've been out of politics as far as safety goes uh believe it or not foreigners were getting mur murdered back in the 80s here oh really oh yeah wow and uh and so when you think of it as a percentage of the foreigners who were directly in, involved with uh, violent behavior at that time, uh, there were m more of us then who were directly involved, you know, we weren't involved uh, in the violence, but we were involved in, uh, let's say, the anguish of the violence. Mm -hmm. So now, what, what happens now is uh, I, I would consider Ecuador probably as safe as anywhere else you could live. I've been to a lot of small villages all over the world where uh, foreigners have gravitated to Asia, South America, in the US, Canada, and there is just as much or more uh, uh, crime is anywhere. There's a lot less crime in Vilcabamba. If you if you're involved with a community here, if you come to Vilcabamba to live or spend any length of time, and you learn to speak the language and treat people well, Vilcabamba is a small village. We all know each other. Uh, I remember once somebody telling me a mouse can't run across the street without everybody in town knowing about it. <laughs> right, right. And talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep. Okay. What, um, let me ask you this. What, how would you describe this community? <laughs> yeah. It's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, that's a loaded question. You better turn off the camera. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it has, what's that? I don't know, is that a Chinese saying where, uh, may you be born in interesting times? I think Vilcabama is the most interesting place by far of anywhere I could ever imagine. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's every level of sanity and insanity and everything in between. And, you know, a lot of people who are, you know, working on uh, enlightenment on a spiritual level and people who are going totally the opposite direction. Sure. But we all get along. Right, right. I mean, we must almost all get along, yeah. even on all of the, you know, the, the contrary Vilcabama groups on Facebook, even people who fight with each other, uh, you know, when we see each other on the street, we're right. hugging and right. laughing. <laughs> right. I mean, it, there is, to me, there's no place like Vilcabama. When I go away, I can't wait to see, you know, either... Vilcabamba when I'm coming over the highway from San, Pe you know, coming yeah. down from San Pedro or when I'm, fl when I'm flying into Catamayo. I mean, it's, it's that coming home feeling yeah. that it's just really special. So what, um, if you could for people, talk a minute or two about the Ecuadorian culture. Like for folks who have no idea, you know, what, what, are, what are Ecuadorians like? Well, uh, Maria's family are probably like most other families, and th they're really close. They have uh, a connection, most of them, to the Catholic religion, and they're extremely generous. And the vast majority of them are extremely trustworthy and 
and um, my, my first experience is, of course, uh, getting to know Ecuadorians closer and closer. Those things, that happens as you uh, develop your command of Spanish. Yeah, absolutely. Because as you get to know what people are talking about and uh, their tone of voice, right. You begin to learn that it's it's a humble uh, country. It's a humble part of the world. People, there's a humility and a non-confrontational aspect to people's personalities that, in some ways, it makes it easy for certain people to take advantage of that. Sure. And. Because I grew up sort of the same way. I mean, we grew up in an Italian family. We were looked down on. Oh, really? You of experienced course. that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was still segregation going on when I grew up. What, the schools, if, if you don't mind the sharing, swimming pools. If you don't mind sharing, what year were you born? 1950. Okay. So, you know, there, were, there was racism uh, apparent there. You know, it, it, my parents more than myself. Sure. I mean, I couldn't, I could, I would listen to things my parents were talking about and I wouldn't understand. I was going, wait a minute, you know, we're Catholic and, uh, anyway, uh, the Ecuadorian culture is a lot like the Italian culture. Traditional, Tradition, old school, like, exactly. yeah, tight knit, all that kind exactly. of stuff. Yeah. And so I felt at home here. When I started to work on this ORCID project, I worked with 11 Ecuadorians. And the ones of us that are still alive, I consider them my best, closest friends. Mm -hmm. I've known them as long as I've known anyone in my life. And when I see them on the streets, we still hug, we still laugh, we still you know, yeah. bring up stories that happened 45 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, there's nothing like being in, in, and I think if you look at this, what uh, uh, they say about happiness, mm -hmm. the happiest people live in villages. Yeah. And I see that in myself, I see that in a lot of people that, are, that are, have been born and raised here, a lot of people that have moved here they're probably happier than they were before they left wherever they came here from. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I see about Vilcabamba is that one of the things that the foreign population has in common, all of us have in common with each other, is that we're happy to be here. A lot of people, wherever they're at in the world, they're not happy. Right. But, and, and so they're looking for a place, that, you know, and maybe that's not the way to go about it, but it just ends up that uh, Vilcabamba is usually a place where most people can find so many reasons to be happy. Sure, there are problems like anywhere in the world. So I'm just going to, I need to check what time it is. Kill it is. Okay, okay, I got, I got time. Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, so I want to ask you, I want to, so it's kind of two questions, maybe they're related. So actually, I'll just start with one. Um, who is, who is Vilcabamba not for, if, if that makes sense? Like, what type of person would hate it here? Well, I've noticed that People who like city life more sure. would certainly rather be in a place like Cuenca or even maybe Loja. Mm -hmm. And people who like cultural events more, people who like the theater, people who like musical events, and uh, people who like varieties of restaurants and cuisines would probably get bored with Vilcabamba and 
and anyone that uh, isn't comfortable being bored right. might not be comfortable in Vilcabamba. Mm -hmm. um, are there any tips or advice you know, if somebody called you on the phone and was like, hey, Dennis, you know, I'm thinking about moving my life to Ecuador, you know, should, you know, what, what, what would you say to them? Like, what, any tips or advice for folks that are kind of thinking about coming here? Well, like everyone I've seen on, online, uh, I think is, is good advice. Better come here and rent for whatever uh, period of time you can afford to stay and, um, and then make the decision little by little. I've mm -hmm. seen too many people move here and uh, even buy property, build a house, and within a year decide to sell and move back to wherever they came from. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I would say there are plenty of rentals in town, out of town, affordable rentals, all sorts of situations out in the middle of nature, in the, you know, inside the, the, the main part of town or within walking distance of the main part of town, really affordable rentals. And uh, so, yeah, I, I've known a lot of people that have done that and eventually left. And a lot of people uh, like Bill Cabamba on, you know, kind of a one or two month a year basis. Sure. You know, come down on their vacation or come down during the winter. Mm -hmm. And so there are people that uh, can take it for short periods of time, but not for the rest of their life. Yep. Is there anything that I haven't touched on, haven't asked about, that you'd like to talk about? Uh, not that I can think of, Jesse. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, if you have Fair any enough. more questions, I can't think of anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Yeah. So yeah, I, Dennis, I I really personally just want to say I really enjoyed this. Um, it's very pleasant for me to sort of your pace and your kind of the way you view life and, 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 and the experience you have. You know, I haven't been here anywhere near as long as you have, so it's really been enjoyable for me. Thank you for doing this and taking the time. Um, yeah, we'll try to, I may even bother your wife. I'm going to hit the office after this. I may just see if I can get 30 seconds of her face on camera if she lets me. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, th we'll put in a little footage, if, if you allow, of, of the ground so folks can see kind of how you set up your life here. And we'll show the juice factory as well. And um, again, I just want to thank you for taking the time. Okay, Jesse. Yeah, I appreciate this too. This is fun. I love talking about <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh the juice bar. It, it's a great story, actually. It and is a great I story. Mean, yeah. from, from making green juice to what the people used to come here for the first time and say, oh, this is the house that Jews built. So, <laughs> right, yeah. right. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this interview, uh, please subscribe uh, to the channel, hit the bell, hit the like button as well. We appreciate it, and we'll see you soon. Take care. So here we are at the Juice Factory. We just interviewed your lovely husband. This is the much more lovely Maria. This is better half. Just want to introduce you guys, show this Juice Factory that we talked about in the interview. Okay. Any, um, anything deeply profound to say? No, just want to say thanks everybody for coming oh. here. So I encourage everyone that comes to Mama, please come and stop it. This is a good for us. Good juice and smooth Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Maria. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs>